Okay. Well, I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to do this talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to mix my interests in astronomy and uh, uh, vision science. Uh, I actually am a graduate of the U of T uh, astronomy program from 1973, so uh, it's, it's nice to uh, combine the two things and come back here and talk about this. And John Percy, in fact, was one of my instructors uh, in my final year of astronomy at U of T. So anyway, we're going to just uh, trip ahead and take a look at uh, the problems of eye safety with uh, both the solar eclipses and uh, the transit of 2012. Now, how do I advance the slides here? Uh, I'm going to need the, yeah, OK. Right, thank you. OK, so uh, I was fortunate to be able to observe the uh, 2004 transit. I took a group to Egypt for that event. And this is one of the shots I took with my uh, setup with an H alpha uh, uh, telescope system. Uh, I was rather ambitious for this. I spent the entire six hours uh, with my group and I was exchanging an H alpha system with my white light system, which is not something that I advise anybody to do because it just means you're juggling an awful lot of things all the time. But I did get some successful photographs uh, out of it. And in fact, I did get one that showed the black drop effect fairly well. At any rate, uh, I got interested in the problems of uh, observing the transit when one of the astronomers on the um, uh, solar eclipse uh, email list queried whether, in fact, it would be possible to see the disk of Venus against the sun uh, with the unaided eye. The problem is that the, um, uh, the disk of Venus is just small enough that if you take the normal uh, criterion for normal vision, which is uh, so-called 2020 or 6.6, and work out the angular uh, equivalent. The disk of Venus is just a bit smaller than that. And the question was, well, if it's just smaller than that, we'll be, be actually able to see it. Now, the trouble is, resolution from that point of view is based on close to separation of two discrete points. Whereas with the disk of Venus, we're talking about a solid extended object. So in fact, it turns out that it's very easy to see it vis uh, by uh, the unaided eye uh, if you're appropriately filtered. But at the time, uh, there were a few people who just hadn't figured that out. In any case, uh, when it comes around for this time, uh, we're going to have an awful lot more people uh, attuned to the idea of the transit. And of course, because it is the uh, uh, once in a lifetime uh, incident for a lot of people, uh, there's going to be a lot of people trying to look at it. And that means that we have to be worried about eye safety. Now, 1999 was the last time that we actually got some really good statistics on what happens when people try to look at the sun unaided. And the paper that was written by uh, the British uh, ophthalmologists in 2000 as a result uh, documented 70 cases in the United Kingdom where much of the country was, in fact, under clouds during that eclipse, but there were enough uh, places, especially away from Cornwall, where the path of totality passed, that they got a number of people who reported uh, different degrees of retinal damage. And uh, like many of the uh, uh, other eclipses where this kind of work has been done, uh, we see that uh, many of these people basically recovered their vision within uh, a fairly short period of time. And uh, it was interesting that when you take a look at how they uh, documented whether or not they'd been uh, looking at the sun uh, appropriately, half of them, no protection at all. Uh, a small minority who claimed that they had been using the eclipse glasses, similar to these, uh, during the eclipse and still got hurt, lying through all six rows of their teeth, as it were. And <laughs> then there were about 35% who used some combination of sunglasses and uh, hurt themselves uh, with those. And that wasn't really too surprising, given the circumstances with uh, the possibilities of infrared transmission and so on. Well, what we do know about solar retinal burns is that uh, uh, the presentation is extremely variable. Uh, person noticing this for the first time, uh, if they've incurred this kind of injury, uh, they can have uh, anywhere from just a slight blurring of their vision 
to the point where the vision is so badly compromised that they look across the breakfast table at their nearest and dearest and can't see their faces. And uh, that brings them in to see people like me, and then we just have to let nature take its course. And over the next few mo weeks to months, their vision gradually changes. And the problem is that what we see on first presentation in terms of uh, the damage at the level of the retina does not really give us any indication of how they're going to recover. And, and that's the hardest part about advising these people about their long-term prognosis, that in fact we just cannot tell what is going to happen. And it's not until about 12 months after the injury that we really know what the final picture will be for them. Uh, we do know that we can build up a profile from all of uh, the last few years. What we do know is that our typical patient who presents on the morning after the, uh, uh, the event is usually in a young adult male, one of those types whose uh, uh, genetics and uh, development are such that they are unaware of or ignore all the warnings that you give them and uh, generally don't use any protection at all. Gee, that sounds like other things too. <laughs> and um, there we go. Enough said about that. But um, that's your typical profile for a lot of these folks that get fried. Uh, we do know also that uh, generally, because there are no pain sensors in the retina, you can do all sorts of things to it without people knowing. And that's one of the things that saves us when we, do, uh, when we uh, see people doing retinal surgery with lasers and so on. You don't have to anesthetize the eye, you just have to immobilize it. But because there are no pain sensors, that means that the uh, uh, part of the retina can be burned by the sun very, very easily and you don't know about it. And these cells are dead men walking in the sense that it takes between 12 and 48 hours after you've actually exposed those cells for them to actually start to uh, show damage and lose their function. And that's why typically we see these injuries uh, about a day after they've actually been incurred. And uh, again, we've all heard that in fact uh, the, the uh, use of an optical aid will increase the severity of the injury because what we find is that the actual physical process of damaging the eye um, uh, results in adding on what we call a thermal effect to the primary injury uh, that is occurring. Now, calculations uh, can prove to, uh, uh, to a good extent that in fact uh, what I first read many years ago about damage at the retina from the sun is really not a thermal process at all. We know what the, star, uh, the solar irradiance level is at the ground. Uh, we can do the uh, calculations of retinal image size and uh, work all the th way through, including taking into account the size of the pupil. What we find is that the actual amount of energy that is being delivered to the eye in the solar image for a naked eye observation is in fact relatively modest. And uh, the temperature increases, which you can uh, calculate just knowing a little bit about thermodynamics and uh, heat transfer and so on, show you that in fact with these kinds of increases in temperature you really wouldn't expect any kind of cellular damage from heat. But yet we know that between somewhere uh, around 40 to 100 seconds is what you need for the eye to be uh, uh, taking on what we call a threshold exposure uh, for damage. So the thing is, what it tells us is that the, uh, the actual mechanism is what we call a photochemical uh, type of injury occurring at the level of the retina, uh, primarily due to short wavelength light. And it involves uh, damage to cell membranes, uh, particularly the ones that carry the pigment which uh, uh, is responsible for the visual process to occur, the, the visual pigment in the uh, uh, photoreceptors. And this is the most common type of injury. Now, if you have an extended observation or a very, very large uh, image like we would get in a telescope or a, a camera without the uh, uh, protective filter, then what will happen is that we overlay this photochemical type of damage with a thermal lesion. And it's the thermal lesion which actually coagulates the cells and causes the permanent injury. And uh, in this particular case, which is of a, a young Indian man from an eclipse back in the 
70s, you can actually figure out from the shape of the crescent burn on his retina when he looked at the sun. Um, and uh, it can be quite a dramatic uh, kind of effect. Uh, so again, we know a lot about what is going on. There have been some other things which allow us with modern um, uh, methods to really uh, track the way in which these kinds of uh, retinal injury progress and how they heal up. Uh, and it's really quite interesting to see, but beyond uh, the scope of what we want to do here. I'm going to try and catch us up on the schedule. Uh, but the basic uh, safe observing methods, uh, of course, we've heard of these all in the context of looking at solar eclipses, but they will be equally good for the transit, the indirect projection. We've already seen an example of the sun scope and uh, uh, also the direct viewers, such as what we've got uh, uh, passed around the room today. And there are a number of these that I'd like to just talk about a little bit in terms of what works and what doesn't. Uh, the sunspotter is a, another variation of those types of folded refractors that are available for a few hundred dollars at most, basically giving you a nice projected image here that uh, viewers can look at without actually looking at the sun. The advantage of these types of instruments is that because it's all closed up like this, it's impossible for somebody to get their head in there so that they can look at the uh, solar image uh, directly through the optics. And this is always the, uh, the fear when it comes to looking uh, at setups uh, such as this with a projected image. The last thing you want to do is have this all set up and somebody gets in and puts their eye right up against the eyepiece. Um, and so these things really have been a godsend when it comes to the safety of these devices. Uh, solar filters, um, too, have uh, come and uh, gone over the years. Uh, the old standby is shade number 14 welder's filter. Uh, the ones that we are most familiar with are the green glass filters. Uh, the problem with glass is if you drop it, it breaks. But it's a very, very reliable filter in terms of what it delivers in terms of protection for the eye. The problem is it's getting very hard to get, and particularly shade 14 uh, is a special order item at most welding supply stores now. Uh, the other problem is that uh, polycarbonate filters have been replacing the glass filters, and unless you get one with a gold coating on it, the problem is that polycarbonate by itself, while it may be dark enough to provide good um, uh, glare protection and, and good protection from the visible light uh, of the sun, it's still highly transparent to the infrared. Uh, in fact, the difference between a polycarbonate filter with the gold coating and one that isn't coated is uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 60 times uh, attenuation. And so one has to be very careful about this. And as a result, I think that most of us in uh, the eye care uh, group are, are really starting to say, let's get rid of the uh, advice about welder's filter and really concentrate on specific filters that are uh, designed really for this particular observation. That means using aluminized resin or polyester type filters as we've uh, received today, or uh, alternatively using the uh, dark polymer, which is another uh, type of filter. Uh, here we have a, a sample of the ones that were made for 2004. You can see this group here flaked out, uh, viewing the sun quite comfortably for however long. And uh, certainly that's a, a very safe way of uh, looking at the, the event without uh, running uh, the risk of damaging the retina. Uh, the black polymer filters that are uh, similarly available in these types of glasses really are just a polymer with carbon black uh, embedded in it. Basically our modern equivalent of smoked glass. And uh, they are equally safe as these aluminized polyester filters that you've received today. The difference is that this membrane is much, much thicker, and as a result, you get a lot of light diffusion through them. So when you look at the sun through the filters you've received today, you get a very, very sharply defined solar disk. With these black polymer filters, you'll get a comfortable view of the solar disk, but it'll have a halo around it because of the light diffusion. Equally safe, but not quite as pleasing a view. Also. The sun seen through these is sort of a yellowish color. 
with these filters that you've received today, you'll probably see a bluish white color just simply because of the uh, transmission characteristics. But again, they work fairly well. The other stuff that we can use is metal coated glass, and this is really reserved uh, for um, uh, optical instruments, cameras, telescopes, and so on, or uh, you know, for high magnification visual use and imaging. And uh, again, they are much, much less accessible to the general public. Uh, there is a new uh, filter that has come out as well that I'll talk about in a moment that uh, is similar to these uh, aluminized polyester filters but has a nicer image. Here's a typical setup. This, in fact, is something like what I'm going to be taking with me to Hawaii in, in June uh, where we've got the objective filter in front of the telescope uh, objective and then down here is the camera or the eyepiece and so on. It gives a, a fairly good image. and. Uh, Again, for binoculars, the same kind of, uh, of setup is, is quite adequate. And this allows you to, to view the sun uh, quite safely through the entire event. Uh, just taking a look at the uh, transmission, uh, again, notice this is a logarithmic plot uh, on the y-axis here. Uh, most of the filters are like this, where there's a very, very high level of absorption here in the ultraviolet. So there's really no um, hazard there. The problem is as we go out here into the visible and then the infrared, we want to really see these uh, uh, around the uh, 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4 level uh, uh, to be safe in the infrared and down at about 10 to the minus 5 or so uh, attenuation for the visible. So that's uh, an in-canal coating. This is the kind of stuff that you find on most of the precision glass filters. Uh, the black polymer is a real neutral density filter, as you can see here. It's, uh, the carbon black does a wonderful job. And this is the thing that uh, was commented on earlier today about uh, smoked glass. It's not the fact that the smoked glass is inherently dangerous. The problem is that with smoked glass, the soot falls off the glass with handling. And that's what makes it dangerous because now the filter has non-uniform transmission characteristics. And if you happen to look through the least dense part of it, you cross the edge and are, are endangered. But if you've got the carbon black uniform and uh, intact, it's perfectly safe. Uh, here's the uh, uh, Botter filter, which is very similar, in fact, to the material here. These are Rainbow Symphony, are they? Do we know? American paper optics. Okay, so uh, slightly different formulation still. But here's roughly the characteristic. Uh, you do get some interesting features because with these, what you've got is actually two layers of aluminized polyester with the, poly uh, the aluminum surfaces face to face. You actually do get a sort of an etalon effect as a result because it's uh, the two films separated by adhesive. So there's a little bit of reflection going on in there and you get this uh, type of uh, uh, effect with the transmission. But they are very, very uh, good in terms of protection. There's a lot of mythology about how fragile these things are. And uh, just to put the point bluntly, I can't get through it. I can wrinkle it, but it's not going to affect the safety of the matter, even though uh, it's rather battered. Puncturing it is not easy. You have to actually use a sharp pointed knife or a nail or something like that. And even then, it's going to be really tough. So are they fragile? No. Will they be protective even like this? Yes. So there we go. Okay, here's the newest uh, member of the stable introduced in 2007. This is Thousand Oaks RG film. Again, you can see it's very, very similar uh, in its character, in its uh, transmission. The difference is it's one mil thick instead of 10. Much, much thinner optically, much, much better. Much, much sharper uh, optical uh, quality. And so this is the stuff that uh, they'll be starting to introduce, I think very shortly into the Rainbow Symphony uh, product. But again, all of these are, are perfectly safe materials. 
Uh, as far as H-alpha is concerned, uh, again, uh, the PSTs and so on allow you to do a lot. This is my own setup uh, with the TMAX 60 in here, the blocking filter. Uh, very good for photographing uh, the uh, solar disk and so on. And the PST, it's baby equivalent. Uh, again, uh, I expect a lot of people will be taking this on transit trips uh, this spring. Uh, the main thing with them is that uh, people will be doing timings with these and they just have to remember since uh, the H-alpha arises from the chromosphere, which is about 30 to 50,000 kilometers uh, higher up, your events are going to be maybe about, I think it was about 30 seconds or so uh, different from your white light observations. And so that's something people are going to have to keep in mind if they're using these types of filters. Uh, calcium K, there's a few of those. Uh, again, the problem with this is that if you're over about 40 years of age, when you look through this, you see nothing but a purple haze. Uh, if you're under 40, your eyes are transparent to this wavelength, you will see a disc. So anybody who's using a calcium K um, PST or, uh, uh, or other kind of system uh, will get a different timing entirely because again, this layer is somewhat different from the H-alpha one too. And um, again, that's going to have to figure into the observation record. But uh, uh, most of these are going to have to be done with electronic eyepieces or cameras. Uh, final thing is there are some standards out there that we can use for rating these. You'll notice that uh, I, I'm not sure. This one may not have it. No, they don't have the, um, the standard certification on these. But uh, the EN1836-2005 standard for sunglasses actually contains a section which we are using to certify uh, these types of viewers for the solar eclipse in Australia in uh, November. And in fact, I and a colleague have just finished uh, running a certification test on uh, a couple of the filters for that purpose using this standard. Uh, we've extracted some of this to put into a new ISO standard. I'm the lead writer on this one and it will be up for uh, uh, second stage voting at our uh, subcommittee meeting in St. Paul at the end of June. And this one is actually going to be a specific uh, standard which will be used to certify these from now on once this gets through the ISO process. We expect that this will be published by the International Standards Organization probably sometime in 2014, which means that we should have it ready for the great North American eclipses of 2017. So I think that's all that I really wanted to say today. Uh, yeah, other than, uh, again, a lot of information. Uh, these sites have already been uh, mentioned before, but um, again, a lot of the safety information uh, up, uh, that I've uh, produced is on both of these websites. And uh, thank you for your attention. take one or two questions. Yeah, David. Hi, Ralph. Thanks very much for your uh, fine presentation. And certainly, any of us who are in education who are advising young people to view know that we've heard from you that oh, you're the man on this. And especially uh, reminds me of the experience I had uh, 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 teaching high school also uh, back when we had the annular eclipse of the sun here in Toronto. Basically, all the advice we got as school teachers on the board is don't which is uh, missing a splendid opportunity. In fact, since I'd heard it, someone talked from you uh, at, uh, at the uh, RSC, I was able to argue against uh, what my school was trying to do, so I was able to have a full observation. So what's your feeling now about how particularly the Toronto area uh, boards, maybe Whitefield, are uh, dealing with uh, both the encouragement to observe and also uh, the safety issue? Well, the safety issue is certainly an important one. And, uh, you know, for for teachers who basically are acting uh, you know, in loco parentis, if you will, uh, during uh, supervised events. You know, the liability issue is, is certainly a, an important one. Uh, I, I think the, the big problem is really, uh, particularly with high school students, it's that, uh, that problem of managing teenagers, okay? 
the behavior, and so on. Uh, a lot of people prefer to err on the side of caution by just saying, well, you know, these are hard people to control, you know, let's just not do it. Of course, the problem is they, then they go off and book out sick or whatever and see it anyway uh, without supervision. So, uh, you know, I think it's certainly something where you can give them all the warnings, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to follow it. You're going to have to do something to try and encourage them to, to observe this event safely. Uh, and, you know, I don't have a, uh, an immediate uh, answer as to how to do that. Uh, the, there's also an additional problem with this particular event, and that is because it's occurring near sunset, uh, most of the time when we talk about using these viewers, it's for an event that's pretty high in the sky, near midday or, you know, at least outside of, uh, out of sight of uh, approaching twilight. As the, as the sun drops down towards the horizon, you look through these things, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to see the solar disk. And at some point, people are, start, are going to start taking them off. Uh, and again, that's, that is a problem. Uh, and how to communicate the safety aspects of that. Uh, basically, um, if it's too uncomfortable to look at directly, don't look at it, right? That, that's about the only advice you can give. Once the sun turns red, you know, there's no more uh, short wavelength light in the disk, then it's safe to look at it unaided. But until it's red, you know, the, your problem is that uh, until that point, you've still got a, a, a risk of hurting your eyes. So it's a real problem. Jay? Many people um, have problems with their eyes. We look in this room, some high percentage of the problems with their eyes. And you've shown evidence that people don't really, except in very rare cases, hurt their eyes permanently at an eclipse. Yet many more people will notice a problem with their eyes the day after and go to their eye professionals <laughs> and, and get treatment that they have deserved all along. So is there a net gain? In my <laughs> That's a very good question, and I wish I had the epidemiological evidence uh, one way or another. Uh, the thing is that, yeah, the, uh, what tends to happen is that you, you get a lot of people coming in uh, thinking there's something wrong with their eyes. There will be some who actually do have damage. There are others who will have nothing and, you know, they'll blame whatever they've noticed on the, the transit or the eclipse or whatever else. And, um, well, fair enough. But, in fact, you know, you can find out whether or not it is due to that. So, you know, the... the the signs are fairly obvious, so that it won't be mistaken. But yeah, it's possible that there will be a few people coming in to uh, get their eyes checked that really should have anyway. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I think okay. All right.